when Howie started the journalism school at Stony Brook, sorry, Rick, um, one of the cool things he did is he started a lecture series called My Life As, where we were going to bring in journalists who were going to tell their story. And because news literacy was designed to be a course for non-journalists, we're really pushy with our speakers. Aren't you surprised? Because we haven't been at all pushy with you guys. Um, so what we do is we say, look, your job is not to tell war stories about journalism. Your job is to tell these students who are studying whatever how you found your passion. How did you make your way to something that you care about enough to do it for 20 years or whatever? So I want to share with you, we videotape these, and we clip them for your use. And I just want to share with you some of the videos from these journalists who come to speak at Stony Brook. These stories never stop. And the one story that will um, clearly never stop is what happened after 9-11. And um, I remember I was, dri I was in the West Bank at the time, and I was driving down the road um, with a friend. And I called a friend, and I said, you do realize that from now on, every single story we do for the next 20, 30 years is going to be about what happened today. And it essentially, I mean, it's not completely true, but it's, it's pretty true. Um, so you're driven, I think, as a foreign correspondent to, to pursue these stories and to keep going and not just to say they're done. One of the jobs of a foreign correspondent, and I think just a job of any news journalist, is to, is to find little places of darkness in the world and to, to shine some light on it. And someone asked me, I, I was talking to some, some of you earlier today, um, you know, how can you, how much good can you do as a journalist and as a foreign correspondent? You see, you go out there, you see so much injustice. And, and I had to say to him, it's limited. It is. You can try, but, um, all you can essentially do is to shine a light on those places of darkness. And then it's in, in a sense, it's up to politicians and policymakers um, um, and, and soldiers, military people to do something, and NGO workers, aid workers to do something after that. But you can keep shining a light on it. And, and as we know, our dear friend and colleague at Newsday, uh, formerly of Newsday, like, like some of us, um, Roy Gutman is the ultimate example of this. Now, Roy um, discovered essentially the Bosnian Serb concentration camps. This is again going back to the Balkans. I'm sorry, it's a very old, old war. Um, but instantly, um, Washington was a buzz about this. And I mean, I would suggest that Roy personally saved many people's lives because these camps were quickly shut down because of the spotlight that. Um, that journalists, including Roy, and he was the first, shone on this story. Um, and some of them risked their lives doing it. We say as a reporter, what was the biggest change that you were able to see or experience or witness there? And, you know, without missing a beat, I always say Weibo or social media. Weibo is Chinese Twitter, basically, although it's a catch-all phrase. There are several different Weibo companies. Sina Weibo is the most famous. There are several others involved. But I say it was the most fascinating change to me in China because uh, it did several things at once. And I'll tell you first how I came about Weibo. I didn't really know much about it, and it was only coming in around 2009, which was good because my period in China uh, coincided almost exactly with the rise of Weibo and social media there. Um, you know, I was in China, and as always, as foreign correspondent, the first tip do, thing you do is look in the local newspapers as your tip sheet to try to find stories that you're going to write about. So I was flipping through a few Chinese papers there, and I saw a story out of Shanghai about a young man who was a driver. His name was uh, Sun Zhongxie. He had actually uh, been a driver for a private company. Um, he was driving along the road one day on a delivery for his company, and, a, and someone flagged him down for a lift. So he gave this person a lift in his car, in this company truck, and a few meters down the road, uh, he was stopped by the police who said, you're operating as an illegal taxi. And he was fined and, and he had his license taken away for a brief while. Now because of this fine, he, he lost his job as a driver for this company. Now he thought this was quite unfair and he went to the courts for redress. He said, look, I was just giving somebody a lift to flag me down, I'm not operating a legal taxi. It turns out this was, a, this was an entrapment scheme by the Shanghai police. They'd been doing this for, for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of drivers, just kind of putting someone on the side of the road to flag them down, 
give them a lift, and then down the road they'd be stopped and, and, and ticketed for being an illegal taxi service. So this young man went to the courts. Of course, you know, they you know, wouldn't take any listen to him, threw his case out. So what happened was uh, he took a pretty dramatic gesture. He stood in front of the courthouse and gathered a few local journalists around and chopped off his little finger. He chopped as a sign of protest. Now this sort of you know, pretty dramatic protest you know, probably had been going on for you know, decades in China. The difference is we never would have heard about it before. And sitting in Beijing, all of a sudden, this guy's story went viral. And I'm sitting in Beijing and I heard about it and I said, well, boy, I got to get down there and see what this was about. So I went down there and found other drivers who were uh, standing outside the courthouse because of this one young man's dramatic gesture who were out there protesting, demanding that the courts hear their case. And I wrote a story basically in that story in two, late 2009 saying that something's changing in China because the courts eventually decided to rehear all of these cases and refund, refund all of these fines that had been issued. In the news literacy course, we've just been talking about the role of the citizen as sort of a counterbalance to the power of government and that journalists are just people who get to pay, paid to be citizens full time, to go dig into files and check things out, find out why people are collecting pensions when they're able-bodied. Does that make sense? Or do you think from your side of it, working as a journal, investigative journalist, that a citizen would be way out of their depth? watchdogging the government? Oh, I've met some citizens who are incredible about requesting records and holding public officials accountable. And I think one of the great things about social media, and this particularly happened during the pension stories, is that we were able to involve citizens. Uh, after the first story broke about Larry Reich, the guy who had five full-time jobs, people were so enraged they were emailing me with suggestions. And I would follow up, or they would send me records, and I would have to make sure that these were the right records. But by the time the stories were done and the reforms were in place, I could really say to people, look, you had a hand in this. And that's pretty remarkable to involve people in your work like that. That was pretty exciting. So what's the, what's the first thing that a student who observes something wrong with government can do that's within their own power? That even if they can't publish it in a newspaper, what can they do um, to take action against some form of corruption? Well, as a citizen, you always have a right to go to a public forum and express your concern and express what you think is wrong. If you want to investigate something, there, it depends upon the story, how you get into it. Um, I love ex-wives. Ex-wives are excellent sources. Uh, I love people who've been fired. I love people who file suit. Uh, they can often lead you to other records and other people who have problems. During the police disability series, I got to know an ex-girlfriend of a guy who was faking his disability. And she literally checked his uh, voicemail. I didn't check his voicemail. I didn't have the code to his voicemail. And that would be a crime if I did that. But after we got a picture of him, I don't know if you guys know what a bucket truck is, where you know, there's that bucket attached to a truck and it goes all the way up if you're working on a utility pole or something like that. Well, we got a picture of him in the bucket truck, proving that he wasn't disabled. And after the story ran, his ex-girlfriend checked his voicemail and another cop had called him and said, how could you be so stupid? In Rwanda in 1994, there was a terrible genocide. The world didn't want to intervene, and there were not the journalists there at the time. And look what happened. In three months, 800,000 to 1 million people were slaughtered. I believe that that would not have happened if we'd all been there. So the power of being there and the power of not being there are equally enormous, and these are enormous responsibilities for all of us who take on this profession. Because it is so powerful, and because it is so, it, 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 it can really make the difference between good and evil. I strongly believe that. The point of this, I'm, I didn't want to speak, I wanted to show you what's available. We have been, we've, we're coming up on our 50th My Life As Speaker, 
we have got full length video for about 25 of them. Plus we've clipped and, and keyworded them to the news literacy curriculum, the salient points. You know, you see her talking about what is the difference between fairness and balance, right? If you were balanced in reporting on the Bosnian genocide, but that was not fair to the evidence. Um, the example we use because it's so obvious and clear is the Holocaust, which you know, now the number of people killed has been confirmed by DNA core sampling of the mass graves, for instance. So um, we have these on a channel called the News Literacy Channel on YouTube. The uh, full length speeches by these people and clips anywhere from three minutes to 13 minutes. We have keyworded almost all of them. We'll finish that this summer. So you can just go on there and do a search and find a video that applies. And now what we're starting to do is integrate them into the course as readings, right? So some homework assignments are to watch Christiane Amanpour talking about moral equivalency and false equivalency and to use that in your essay on fairness and balance. And uh, we try to hit as many broad subjects as we can. Obviously, Keith Richberg, who was here in May, it was a great session on the power of social media. Um, the Matt, Matt McAllister piece is great on the, just that idea of the power of information and the lengths to which powerful organizations will go to suppress information. You can damn well bet that we're going to be using uh, Attorney General Holder in the fall course on you know the, the lengths to which the Napoleons of the world say, I fear three newspapers, more than 100,000 bayonets. That's the role of journalists in the classroom, not to come in and say, well, there I was, bullets was creasing my scalp. You know, the, the point is not that. The point is to say, we're trying to teach you to think like a journalist about verification, to think like a journalist about which sources are reliable, which sources are not. And these tools, I think, are incredibly powerful. And I know this because I survey the students and the non-journalists say, I had no idea, you know, the effort that goes into this. I had no idea how hard it is to verify a fact, you know, to prove that something is true. And so it's really valuable, and we put those up there for you to use. Um, thank you very much. Next up.